So good morning, everyone, and welcome to London. I'm a Lon Londoner, so I'm happy that you're all here from all the different countries that are represented, irregardless of the uh, political situation that we currently have at the moment uh, and the government. I'm here today to talk a little bit around AI, of course. Why, why would we be here if we weren't? But more importantly, the humanitarian applications of it. And, and as JJ quite rightly pointed out, I think we all hear a lot about the negative applications of this. Actually, if we get a show of hands, who has a positive outlook for AI in the room? That's quite good. It's quite a mix. Who has a negative outlook of AI? OK, uh, maybe a few less. Maybe we've got a more educated audience potentially here today than, than we see elsewhere. Because there is a fear, and quite rightly so, with what AI is there to do and what data is being used for. And I think there's a lot of miscommunication around this, typically, in the media, to grab headlines, to kind of showcase this. And funny enough, I was actually getting my hair cut in the barbers yesterday, and I mentioned about this conference today, and my barber said, that AI is listening to us all the time, and it's going to start to uh, use that information against me, and the governments are spying on me. And I had to talk to this guy, and I say, that's a, that's a fair argument, that's a fair understanding. But do you know the good benefits? And what, are the, what, are, what is AI being used for to benefit us as, in terms of humanity? And he couldn't understand at the time what that was. And I explained to him what I'm going to explain to you today, some of those good outcomes and, and what we're actually seeing as beneficial to all of us as a society, as opposed to just corporations that, that may want to use AI, potentially for nefarious means. I think we can all agree that there's a great power in data. Data is the new, new fuel, as it were, is the oil that powers most systems. But the key to data is the intelligence that you can get from it. And really, that's where AI comes into this. But what I focus more on to begin with is analytics, where you can understand the patterns that exist within data. You can then communicate those patterns out to organizations. And AI and analytics, there is an intersection with that. AI is much more focused around the automation of this process. But really, if you're not understanding the data, providing those insights in a way that can be communicated and understood and therefore actioned against, then what is really AI there for? AI as a term is an umbrella. It means lots of different things to lots of different people. And there are lots of key words that I've put on the screen that will form pillars or the grounding foundations of what AI is. And AI, as I'm sure most people in the room would know, is, is not new. As a terminology, it's been around at least 70 years. In fact, the organization I work for have been building machine learning applications for 40 of those years. So this isn't necessarily anything new. But what has changed is the volumes of data, the variety of data, the processing power, the commoditization of machines that can be used for this. So there is great power in this, but with this power comes responsibility and what we should be focusing the usage of it on. Now, I've put up, and, and thank you again, JJ, for asking the question beforehand, to, to talk about the humanitarian issues that we all face as a global community. We're all family in this room in terms of the issues that you see on the, on the wall there. And hence why I've used a nice little heart to surround this as a word cloud. What I'm going to do is pick out a few of these. And these are just a few cases, but where we are seeing AI being used for positive humanitarian efforts. And that includes things like global healthcare, wildlife conservation, and disaster relief. How is AI being used on a global scale to empower people, to augment the human population, to help with these quite large issues that we're all facing today. So what I'll go through is a few, a few of these, we'll, we'll cover these as use cases, and I'll explain what's being done today, and at the end of the session, how you can all in this room help as well. As an audience of practitioners, those that have got the skills to help in this effort, I'll give you some advice and uh, some areas that you can take this to. So you've probably all heard of Data for Good. Has everyone heard of Data for Good as a movement? Maybe a few people. 
Yep, certainly, yeah, Gregor. AI for good, data for good. These are initiatives that, that work across the world. There are a number of organizations that sign up to this. Quite large corporations are involved. But this really goes down to humanitarian efforts. And this is how analytics can help humanity. How can data be used in a way that empowers the population as opposed to works against it? A few of the company organizations that I, that I work directly with, I will explain how they're using this data in a way that is benefiting the general populace today. Uh, VUMC is a medical center in Amsterdam. They're, and I will go through this in detail, but they're very interested in cancer detection, the early stages of cancer detection. They're collecting a lot of data across Europe to bring together in the aid of identifying insights, identifying anomalies, both in uh, image data and unstructured text data, so case notes based upon uh, files that have been collected on patients. The IOM looks around uh, migration. This organization is helping disaster relief where the general populace are under threat from natural disasters, for example. IOM, IOM typically are on the ground first to help facilitate any kind of care or support that's needed within that population. Now, the biggest issue the IOM have is getting to that right data, finding resources that are needed to support. In the example I will give, after the earthquake in Nepal in 2015, there was a great need for corrugated iron to help with roofing for those populations that have been displaced. Now, how can they get to that data quickly? But not only can they get to that data, how can they analyze it, understand where all of that, um, uh, in this case, corrugated iron exists, and be able to ship it in as quickly as possible? And then finally, wild track. This is a conservation effort that started in um, South Africa, looking at the rhino populations. They were, they're very keen on non-invasive ways of tracking. So how can you track migratory patterns of endangered species without physically uh, getting involved with those and, and altering their habitat through human means? And what they're doing here is not only using AI to support that effort, but they're utilizing a mechanism to crowdsource information, so collect data from the general populace that can then be labeled and can be tagged and then be used as a source of information. So crowdsourcing of data is also another key aspect to how we're seeing these Data for Good AI projects uh, evolve and develop. If we start with BUMC, one of the questions they came to us with to begin with was, can AI actually help enforcing a breakthrough in the development of innovative treatments to cancer? Cancer is a terrible thing. It, affect, it, must have, it will have affected everyone in this room. And I think it's a third of us will actually develop some form of cancer at some point in our lives. So it's, it's something that affects all of us. It's a global concern. Can AI do anything about this? Can AI be used in a good way to help identify breakthroughs, help identify early treatments to the general population. What they looked at in doing is not only using the data they were collecting, but providing an augmentation to the physicians that we see as the general population. How can we provide more information? How can we provide more relevant data to those physicians to help in the diagnosis? In this case, they began looking at liver and brain cancer. This has actually evolved into multiple different si uh, sources now from a cancer protection perspective. So what did they start with? Well, image data. We, when we talk about AI, we talk a lot about computer vision. So understanding context from images, identifying objects in images, identifying transitions within those images. And again, Gre Gregor had a great, great example from what we were looking at from satellite information. Again, from the healthcare profession, x-rays, CT scans, MRIs are being collected all the time. In fact, in the US alone, only a couple, uh, 2017, there were over 600 million procedures that created images. That's led to thousands of terabytes of data being collected in the US alone as of a couple of years ago, and that's increasing every year. 
So there's a lot of data out there. But this usually gets treated in silos. This will be used in uh, individual medical centers. It'll be used in individual hospitals. Practitioners are heavily worked. Those physicians have a great con cognitive stress in their workload today. How can they possibly look through that amount of data individually? It, it's, it's very difficult. And, and they are able to look at some, but not all of it. So the application we worked with them on, and this is something that they've deployed, is a concept of, a, if you're familiar with uh, neural networks, convolutional neural networks are very good ways for detecting images and patterns and anomalies that may exist within Im images and then classifying those images. And what they were using object detection to do is identify nodules and legions that existed within those X-ray scans, those CT scans, those MRI scans. But on top of that, this isn't just a simple problem of extrapolating information from image. As I mentioned at the start, they're collecting a large source of data, both from an image perspective, but also from a textual perspective. And this includes things like medications, family history, diet, lifestyle, previous information that had been collected about those patients, and relating that to the behavior that's being observed within the images. And this becomes a problem of natural language processing, identifying topics, entities, categories that exist within those case notes that can be aligned directly to those images. Now, there's great power here. And this isn't just a use case for insure, uh, health care, but in other sectors where you've got, you've got information through unstructured means coming in different forms, bringing that together in a way that can give you even more insight from it. The application that we developed with them is providing them with learning and automation to identify different treatment possibilities and outcomes that they could provide directly to their patients. And really what this becomes is a facilitator to the physicians. It's not a replacement. You don't have a machine telling you this is what you need to do. There is still a, a human face to this. But imagine the power that the physician now has with that additional information that they can then take and make a, and the, make a correct decision against that patient for. That not only increase, increases accuracy of the decision, but also increases the speed in which they can detect and identify these issues. So again, this is a great use case of how AI is being used. And just to give you an, a sample of this, this is a, um, a three-dimensional scan that it was used for the lower abdomen. Now, in this, there is actually a nodule that's of concern. But again, to get to that, there's a lot of data there in those uh, three-dimensional views of that piece of information. Now, even practitioners can miss that. It's very easy to miss something that's quite small in this particular location. But when you're bringing together data from many different locations, all with similar information against it, this starts to become more apparent and more easily identifiable. And as I said, in terms of what we've done with the cancer center in Amsterdam, the quote from the, the lead physician that we worked with, an in-depth scan has a lot of data, and the outcomes can be improved with the use of advanced analytics on patients' health data and history. This is having benefits today. This is how AI is being used for good today, and how all of us should be seeing the use and expecting the use from our healthcare providers and how they should be using these applications to benefit all of us. So the good from this, real world problems are very complex. We can all agree as humans, it's very difficult to solve these types of problems. I believe that AI techniques can enhance human endeavors in this space, particularly in the example here within healthcare. AI is being used to help this. It's being used to augment human efforts and improve on human efforts. The next case, I mentioned WildTrack. It based out of South Africa, and as I mentioned, we focus a lot on uh, rhino populations to begin with. This has actually been spread across the globe as an initiative. WildTrack is an organization. Uh, they're a conservation effort for, through non-invasive means to track uh, endangered species. And again, the question we had with this organization was, can AI protect those animals from extinction? And the answer, in fact, lies in their footprints. 
footprints of animals, their migratory patterns can be detected based upon images, again, but where they are locally, so how you're tracking those GPS. And they wanted to naturally uh, monitor those habitats without uh, intervening, without tagging those animals, without putting people in line of, of, of sight of them even, so that they're not affecting the habitats in the, in the wild. And the way they went about this, so again, we talked about the collection of data, big data being the lifeblood of uh, artificial intelligence. It is hard to collect data. Data is messy. Data quality is an issue for everyone. I, I personally believe that for good AI, you need strong foundations in data, and, and that's often overlooked. The difficulty in collecting the right data. Now, the way this organization, which they're not a big organization, they don't have the manpower to do this, they decided to go about it through crowdsourcing. So they created a website. They provided the general public with a means to upload their own images around endangered species. In fact, I'll show you in a second that we can all do this. And we, I doubt we're going to find many cheetahs and rhinos just walking around London. I don't know. It depends what's happened uh, in the zoo. But this means that in those locations where there, were, there is natural wildlife that is endangered, people can upload images. They can share those images. Those images are then classified. Again, they're using uh, machine learning behind the scenes to identify species, gender, age of an individual. But then utilizing that on top of geolocation data, identifying roaming patterns, how these animals are moving through their environment. Is there any issues related to poaching in that area that can be a link to it? And as I said, this is being used through crowdsourced data, but they've enhanced this now by using drones. So drones are now being used to capture even more imagery that can be used to empower this process. And this leads to that conservation effort and anti-poaching. And as I mentioned, although we started off in South, America, uh, South Africa, South America, Russia, uh, Turkey, all have, the, all have animals that are potentially near extinction. And this process works for all of them. Being able to crowdsource and collect that data, labeling that data, applying a model to it, could be done for any animal. It doesn't matter which animal that is. So the benefits here. At this point, they're getting about 90% accuracy. Now, that, that's got room for improvement. But immediately, that's coming from data that, that is also a bit messy. These are being taken by people on their phones, for example. It might be on a, on a camera that's not got a high resolution. But that's giving them something to identify print animals in a better way than they could do without the help of the general populace. And as I said, we can all access this. You, you're welcome to check this uh, website out after the session. WildTrack have crowdsourced this by enabling anyone to upload their images to the to the, to the website. And as I said, based upon where that location is, based upon the footprints that are being captured, they're using that data. And all that data becomes part of the training and the learning of the modeling process. So there's no limit to what AI can do, particularly if you look to crowdsource to inspire the solving of big problems. And as I said, even within the VUMC, the healthcare study, a very similar approach there. Being able to pull together data from lots of different locations, from different groups, different, lo uh, different countries even, is a great way to get the best good out of AI. The, the final example I want to give. So I mentioned about the earthquake relief efforts in Nepal, terrible uh, issue that occurred in 2015. What we partnered with IOM to do on UN migration was to understand whether data could be used, could they collect the right data and put the right processes and analyses in place to respond much faster to disaster relief efforts. As a res first responder, IOM were on the ground immediately to identify where shelter was needed for the general populace that were being displaced by the terrible earthquakes. Now, their job is to provide support. Their job is to provide temporary accommodation for those that have been displaced. But in order to do that, they needed to identify the right resources, the right availability of roofing, in this case, corrugated iron, 
to protect those most vulnerable members of the population that were needed to be helped. And the way we supported on this, there's actually a, a UN repository of data, global trade data, over the last 70 years across 200 countries that shows where resources are and where they exist and which companies have a surplus, which potentially have a deficit. But that's a lot of data. Again, we're talking terabytes of data here. So having access to that data is the start, but being able to explore and identify insight in that is the difficulty. There was over 300 million rows of data in the data set that we made available to them. This enabled them to do visual geomapping of locations of resources that they could then make available. And in this case, they actually found that India, very close to Nepal, had an oversurplus uh, over, uh, over of raw materials that they could immediately tap into, use as a source to then build these uh, uh, temporary houses. They were able to allocate the right resources. They were able to highlight exactly where the riskiest areas were, so the key populations that needed to be supported in the first instance, across 45,000 families, and they actually managed to bring in 310,000 sheets of metal to support this population. Again, this wouldn't have been achievable without the source of data, but being able to get the insight on that data as quickly as possible. And this, is, this greatly helped the resource efforts in terms of finding the homes and the, the houses. But as we can see here, Brian Kelly, who was the uh, Regional Emergency and Post-Crisis Advisor for IOM, stated that understanding what's possible is how you end up closing camps, getting people back to home, and helping them to move on with their lives. And again, being able to identify these resources, bringing those in at the right time, was key to this effort. It's key to their successful support of this population. So for success beyond AI, you need to look at the data. And this applies to all of us. This is not just um, for humanitarian purposes, but all of the organizations, all of the industries we work in, a strong foundation in data is key to success in AI. And we should never forget that. And I think it's easy too, because the hype and the sexiness of AI becomes the focus, and the algorithms that we're using become the focus. But I would always spend, if I had six hours, I'd spend five and a half of those hours interrogating the data first and making sure that data was fit for purpose and only spend 30 minutes developing the algorithm on top. So there's three good use cases of AI. Hopefully, you see the good in all of these. And this goes across taking the complexity out of AI, informing us as humans, empowering us as humans, crowdsourcing data to solve the biggest problems that we see today, and looking beyond the data to make sure we do have these solid foundations in data beyond just the AI itself. And one kind of final point I want to talk about, I'm a big advocate of something called fate. I don't know if you've come across this before, it originated from the Max Planck Research Group around how AI is being used and should be used. And FATE stands for fairness, accountability, transparency, and explainability in AI systems. This is core to making sure that not only we have trust in these systems, but that the general population understands what AI is there to do. And this should be at the heart of all AI projects making sure that what you're doing is fair to those that are impacted by it. You're accountable to the decisions that the automated systems are making. There's transparency in the process of how that data is being used. And you can explain those use cases. And you may have seen something like this before, but in the case with VUMC, it wasn't just about using a complex neural network to identify these images. It was about identifying what were the key issues what was leading to this, explaining, for example, within the case notes, what symptoms were being identified as core to what was happening with those graphics and those images. So a call to action. You've all got your phones, as JJ's already identified. We've partnered with a number of global uh, organizations on something called this Gather IQ app. It's a data for good app. You can all download it. It's free to download. 
And this is something we can all do. It gives uh, an overview of the uh, UN 17 global goals, which have been designed for a better world, but gives you ideas in which you can help and actually proactive steps that we can all engage on to help with these efforts. So please, if you do download any app and you spend any app time during your break, make it sure it's this one in terms of how you're using it. And I'll leave you with this. I'm a great believer in the power of AI and how AI can be used to exponentially help us as humans. I personally believe that together, the possibilities of an augmentation of AI humans are exponential, and we should all be looking at enhancing what we can do today with the machines and the capabilities that exist around us. Thank you. Thank you, Ian Brown.